Uh, my name is Suhail Al Gusebi. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Felek Consulting. Felek is a values based, purpose driven strategy and innovation consultancy. And I have the extreme pleasure of sitting with a very distinguished um, panel here. Before making the introductions to the panel, I would like to uh, reiterate my thanks uh, to the organizers for this very important and relevant MTech conference. Uh, Mr. Riyadh Sater, Dr. Ahmed al Sheikh, thank you very much for your efforts. Very good. May I ask the audience to give the organizers a big clap because I know this took a lot of effort. <laughs> thank you very much. So <clears throat> I'm sitting here with a with, um, very distinguished gentleman, Mr. Ali Musa, Managing Director with uh, JP Morgan, Mr. JK Khalil, GM Saudi Arabia and Bahrain for MasterCard. Um, Mr. Mark Warman, founder and digital consultant in East Innovations, and we're also joined by Mr. Ashar Nizam, Nazim, excuse me, a fintech investor and advisor. Welcome, gentlemen. So, my first question is, is to our distinguished banker on the panel. We heard your, your colleague giving um, a very interesting presentation. As a, we hear that digital transformation, we hear the words blockchain, we hear um, uh, industry 4.0 and so on. And there's a lot of chatter of the banks disappearing, becoming irrelevant. To what degree is that true? And does that scare you or not? Uh, thank you, Sahil. Um, and again, uh, I would like to start uh, Mr. By Ali, I'm going to inter inter interrupt one moment here. I'm very sorry for my interruption. I have a rule when it comes to panels. Okay. What happens on a panel sometimes is that one person takes up 80 or 90 percent of the speaking time from everybody else, right? So I'm very strict. We'll do about three minutes each, and if I cut you off, it's not because I'm being rude, but it's because we need to give space for everybody else, okay? No, so please, my, my apologies. Go no, ahead. thank you for that. And again, uh, I would like to express my thanks and appreciation for having me here. Um, uh, I, I think this forum is a great opportunity for us to discuss matters which is really very critical for the banking industry, uh, especially in Bahrain, that ha there has been a lot of focus, and, and Bahrain have always been pioneering and advanced in terms of taking in new initiatives that uh, set uh, you know, the platform uh, and the future for the region. Um, so back to your question, Sohail. Um, I, I think uh, investing is in fintech and in technology is not a choice anymore, it's a must. Um, I think for us as a bank, um, the question is not whether we invest. Uh, the, the question is we want to be relevant uh, to the business. Uh, and that's why I think the question comes to us as a bankers all, what is the right technology that we need to invest in? Uh, again, as a bank, uh, our main assets, I mean, our main stakeholders are the customers. And I think uh, if we want to benchmark uh, in terms of what is the right technology and whether it makes relevant for us to invest in which type of fintech, uh, is, is, uh, you know, we need to base it on how much that will add value to our uh, client base. Uh, so re really it's not a, it's not a choice, it's, it's a must, and it's very, very relevant in the industry that we are in today. Thank you. I'm going to move to the, to the other end of the panel. Ashar, you're, you're, you're a fintech investor and advisor, okay? And within three minutes, give our audience here, explain exactly what fintech is, what, and, and what excites you as an investor, what you're looking at. Right, so thank you so much, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. So uh, starting with, again, the definition of fintech, very briefly, uh, it's all, all often confused with automation or digitalization, right? Uh, as we see it, automation was the basic starting point, which was about an organization looking an inside out, having an inside out perspective from an efficiency perspective. Uh, then came the digitalization, which is more about wearing the customer lens and saying, okay, an outside in perspective of how things should be done. And then comes the fintech, which is really about a brand new ecosystem, which is platform driven, a single channel that connects uh, the traditional world with the new world of techs and new media, 
uh, through a number of exponential technologies. There are eight, nine of them. Uh, the speaker before us highlighted them. And this is about, again, the use of APIs as the core of that connection. Right. So uh, uh, again, a lot of banks uh, have moved on from automation to digitalization. Very few are in the space of fintech at the moment. Uh, they're still experimenting. When we look at investing in, in platform companies, so Phenocracy is a platform company. Our ambition is we are headquartered in Bahrain. Our ambition is to launch 15 platforms uh, over the next five years. Well, four now, because we are already uh, well into our second year. We are into our sixth platform. When we invest in platforms, we look at a, most importantly, what is the business challenge that it is solving, right? A technology is an enabler. And two, is it scalable, right? Uh, and, and finally, that new business model has to be really transformational. Because what we are seeing is fintech ecosystem is displacing uh, both the cost structures and where the profit pools come from. For example, uh, remittance business is no longer what it used to be, right? For example, we talk about EKYC platform. But really, what is the advantage of that EKYC platform? One, yes, customer experience. Uh, two, is uh, very importantly, very, very importantly, uh, think about market of Bahrain. Today, Bahrain market is about, what, 500,000 bankable customers, right? Uh, the regulations allow GCC nationals to open bank accounts in, uh, across any GCC markets, right? Why was it not being uh, really exercised? Because customers were required to walk into a branch right, to open a bank account. And today, with EKYC, you're talking about borderless banking within GCC. Like, wow, right? I mean, it opens up the market for Bahraini banks to the entire GCC, sitting from Bahrain. So it is those kind of disruptive models that we look to invest in. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> we'll move now <clears throat> to Mr. Uh, uh, AJ. You, uh, JK, excuse me, you represent MasterCard. And I've seen news uh, reports and, and read articles about MasterCard in, uh, embracing innovation, uh, having its own um, sort of R&D innovation lab, as it were. Uh, the CEO, uh, Mr. Ajay Banga, is, is very keen on this. So uh, in the digital world, are credit cards still relevant with e-payments, with all this kind of stuff? Is it a struggle to catch up, or is it really leading the future? Um, thanks for the question, uh, and, and the way you asked the question, actually, uh, because you allow me to take a segue and take a minute to uh, clarify something very important before we start. Uh, so I know it's a bit misleading, because there's a, there's a word card in MasterCard, but we're not a card company. Right. We're a financial. Uh, payment technology company, and that's very Say important. Say that one more time. We're a financial payment and technology company, or a financial okay. payment nice. and financial like technology it. company. Uh, and that's very important to distinguish, because while others may be card companies, and will probably still be for maybe a few more years, unless they want to survive, uh, we're, we have made that decision very clearly and distinctively, distinctively. Actually, 10 years ago, when Ajay joined the company, and he said, guys, we're no longer going to be a card scheme. We're going to be a technology uh, company and what that means is we're, we've changed from a scheme to an enabler, right? Uh, that's why you've seen uh, things like labs, which is basically our Mastercard labs is our effort to externalize all our R&D efforts and all of our internal innovations, and see and explore and 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 roll them out to our partners and our clients, so that they can leverage them into their own uh, internal environments, whether they are banks or merchants or governments. Um, so. Uh, to, to answer your question, you know, it becomes very easy after I make that definition yes. that we have adopted that new way, uh, right? That uh, technology is at the center of everything, and we don't no longer see card as a, a sort of core business in our company. Uh, we see it as just one enabler of a certain use case, and where it doesn't work, we have other technologies to, to supplement. Whether it's on the remittance side, where we don't necessarily, you know, have cards as a uh, a necessary uh, input, uh, you know, value, value, store, uh, value storage input uh, uh, point. So we have remittance technologies that have, you know, any in, any out. So you can fund them whichever way you want, and you can receive them any way you want. We have account-to-account -account technologies. 
Uh, we've recently acquired Vocalink, which is an ACH company. So that's, that runs basically 80% of the UK government business and now runs in six other countries and very soon in one of the GCC countries. So um, we have adopted this technology mindset to your, to your point. We are no longer focused on card as you know, the product. It will certainly continue to be a core and a very important product and certainly the technology and the rails that actually run our card network, which are phenomenally you know, robust, uh, extremely fast, secure, uh, and safe, will continue probably to enable other forms of technologies, right? But the, the, the direction has been definitely set. We are no longer a card company, we're a financial technology company, and that, uh, that comes out uh, uh, not just in the ethos of our company and the culture, but in everything that we do. So my, my quick follow-up question is payoff. Ten years ago, this was made a priority. Uh, you are now a, a technology company more than you are a card company. What's the payoff been for MasterCard? That's a very good question. If you look at the stock price ten years ago, maybe it was like in the, in the ballpark of $15, and now it's $220. So if that's any significance. Um, Makes me wish I bought ten years yeah, ago. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Makes Warren Buffett wish he actually bought ten years ago. Okay, yeah. excellent. Sure. Mark, off to you. You wrote an article called Digital Transformation Has Nothing to Do with Technology. How it, dare you write such an article? What did you mean by that? Okay, so obviously digital transformation does have something to do with technology. But my point is that technology can only be seen as the building. And I believe that uh, culture change and that change management and a focus away from internal drivers uh, over to external drivers where we're seeing where the customer experience lies and how we can provide solutions that can match that customer experience. That needs to be identified first before any investment in technology can provide any sort of uh, benefit to the company that's investing. And I think the unfortunate thing is that if investment in digital happens before that understanding of the customer need, <coughs> excuse me, and the customer expectation, there can be uh, a ripple effect from the poor implementation of a digital project. So investment can go into the digital project, uh, it, can go, it, it can end up going nowhere, not fulfilling a customer need and therefore not getting the uptake that people are expecting. Uh, and therefore, there's a, a feeling that digital isn't successful for our business, that it's not going to take us anywhere, where really it's the poor implementation and lack of understanding of the customer experience that's led to that poor uptake of the digital offering. Um, I'll give you a, a personal example of this. So about 20 years ago in the 90s, when I was five years old, I, uh, I worked for a big chemical company the biggest in the, in the region, I won't mention the name, I was in the London headquarters. And we were in the process of adapting then a, 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 a ERP called BAN, if you guys remember BAN, B-A-A-N. And I think the company spent literally tens of millions of dollars. But what it didn't do is adapt operations and, and, and the business model according to the technology. So what they did is they brought the technology, they adapted it so much to the operations that at the end you couldn't update. And then it was scrapped some years ago and then SAP was brought along and so on. So I think customer experience is, is vital, but operations, business model adaptation, all these things are vital. Yeah, and when, I mean, I talk about customer experience, but really I, you know, user experience or, or people experience, mm -hmm. whether it's the, the end user, whether that's uh, a customer within a retail uh, banking situation, or whether it's the staff within the company itself, it's people that need to be thought of first. Um, and more often than not, the, the issue that I see, that I come across, is that um, it's departmental silos. So um, decisions are made by the IT division as to the software that's going to be rolled out for the HR department. Uh, worse than that, often the HR department isn't then discussing or, or meeting the other departments to find out what their needs are from the HR department. So these decisions are made uh, in isolation without that input from the other departments. And again, it's the same situation where we have software that's not fulfilling uh, the role that they're looking for it to be. And so there's significant investment without that return on investment. When, when we speak to clients about innovation, um, we're not a tech company. 
so we partner with people for the technology side of things. So we, we do the process of innovation, the culture of innovation, and really the conversation must start with the culture. If you have a certain type of culture, a certain way of doing business, certain things will work for you, certain things will not work for you, and then so oftentimes you enter into disastrous situations because of exactly what you said. So Ali, I know you want to say something. Yeah, uh, just to add on that and, and how we can find a common ground between what the business needs, uh, what uh, the fintech can build and make it available for us as a bank, and what makes it easy and simplify the process for our client. I think that's why my colleague earlier discussed uh, the in-resident program. Mm -hmm. What we do with the in-resident, and I think this is exactly the same concept here in, in Bahrain Fintech uh, Bay, uh, is, is, is a way that you connect uh, the innovators with the, uh, with the uh, bankers uh, expert, but also bring data, real data available for them and always when we look at fintech, it's not about announcing that we are adopting the first blockchain in the industry. I think th this, is, this has been a trend. But I think what makes relevant is really build what is good for your client, what will simplify and automate uh, the, the client experience. Uh, and, and more importantly is, is that we solve a problem. I think if we just want to build for the sake of mm -hmm. investing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, without really having a specific problem to solve, there will be a problem. And it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a multi-layered problem because you might be under pressure to invest in the latest shiny new thing. You might get a call from the board saying, you know, we we're hearing about this new tech, what are you doing about it? Or you, you know, so you've got to do it, you know, uh, um, you need to proceed with caution rather than jump in with, with all guns blazing. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, my, my boss, my direct boss, uh, he's a gentleman who spent uh, his time as a consultant with McKenzie. He joined JP Morgan 10 years ago. And when he came and he was given a task of running a global business, he went to the key a manager within the business and he gave them his view and none of them were able to understand what the new trend is required. So what he did, he said, forget we are bankers, right? We are not good in fintech and we cannot even adopt or change our, the way we think. So what he did today within the management team, uh, we have a fintech expert. Uh, it, it adds two value. Number one, we as a management in the business, we could be buying a service, and if we don't understand how to evaluate that service that we buy, we might make a, a mistake. And also we are a seller, we provide services. So that FinTech expert to be planted within the management team is very, very important for providing the relevant solutions. What about, um, so this expert is there, what are you doing to renew and update the knowledge of, of the team members? Uh, I, I think it comes over time and it comes from experience uh, because I, I think what is really important, uh, and again, I go back to uh, what makes relevant for us as a bank. We need to ask ourselves key questions. Uh, is the product we are providing, uh, does it provide more security? Uh, does it reduce the cost? Uh, does it reduce the human error? Because this, these are the things that we suffer in banking mm -hmm. and in a normal mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. as usual. So really, if we tick th these boxes, then we will make relevant for our business and also for our client. Thank you. JK, tell me about the changes, the customer experience is happening or user experience and business model changes that you see in your role in MasterCard. Do I have an hour? <laughs> so look, the, the short answer is they're everywhere and they're plenty. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna take a step back here for just for a second. So the innovation works in mysterious and very different ways. So when I hear Mr. Ali talk about uh, how they, they manage at JP Morgan, it's a very uh, sort of uh, large corporate view of the world, right? It's very measured, it's very balanced, and, and I totally understandable, right? I'm not uh, criticizing. Um, and that's the way large corporates sort of innovate or internalize out external innovations. 
when we look at industry innovations, which is very different, right? I have a, an entire sector, like all of payments, all the body of you know payments and its different form factors and its different use cases and its different players, whether they're banks or aggregators or payment facilitators or you know PSPs or whatever. It, it, innovation just hits you. It's it's like you're standing in the line of fire and there's like bullets flying all yeah. over, right? So how do you capture all that? First of all, you just try not to. You just broaden your net, right? And what we've done, for instance, uh, similar to your in-residence, but in a different way and much more uh, uh, sector, uh, you know, cross-sector. We've created a program uh, about a few years ago called Start Path. Now, Start, Start path, path? Start Path, correct. Path, okay. Yep. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. Start Path is a, is a platform that essentially um, allows us to scan the entire industry of fintech and actually anything around use cases and digitization of so anything MTech actually, effectively. Um, and we capture innovations that we feel will be relevant, potentially, right, to our sector. And we keep them on our radar. As we start feeling that they are actually going up the relevance, let's say, scale, then we start saying, let's bring them closer and let's provide them coaching and a bit of direction and mentoring and see where that goes. As, as they graduate to the next level, we may you know, either, either present them to a bank or a very large institution that want, would like to internalize them or partner with them or invest in them, or we ourselves in the, invest in them but continue to propose them as a partner solution to our banks. Um, and, and this is basically our way to sort of try to map an entire galaxy of changes, right, and, and identify what are the relevant um, areas to focus on uh, you know, amongst all the noise that's happening in innovation. So it, it's, it's not an easy job, um, and I'm just trying to simplify the answer as much as possible. Uh, it's, no, it's no easy feat, and um, it's actually, now StartPath, by the way, is, is not just a MasterCard product. Uh, it's a platform that we invite our banks and our merchant partners and our government partners to come and see once or twice a year so that they can actually have a look at 40, 50, you know, um, quite mature, progressed, advanced startups at a time, and make up their mind and decide, well, you know, is this something that I can internalize? Is this something I should watch, you know, uh, watch out for? Is this something I can partner with or test or test even outside as a separate silo? You know, that I don't have to bring it under my brand. I could just partner with them as a, as a sort of a venture, you know, a joint venture, and we can start something on the side, see how it goes, and then decide later whether to internalize it or not. And this is not theory, right? This is, I mean, we have very close banks and merchants from around the region, whether it's Saudi, Bahrain, or UAE, that have actually gotten on that platform and have started to utilize and uh, touch these startups and start to interact with them um, and see where that thing, I mean, it's an experiment, right? We don't know where we're going. We've never had, it is unprecedented change at an unprecedented rate. So, you know, people have to be really open-minded. Organizations have to really break the shackles of conservatism in a way, right? And go out there with an open heart and mind, and um, you know, and see what's out there. Uh, a, a key word that you use that I would uh, concur uh, is 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 it's experimenting. I think when you when you make a change, it's better to say, well, let's experiment with this. From a mindset perspective, it's better, because if you say, here's how we're going to do things, if it goes wrong, now it's you, you, you need to use the, you know it's uncomfortable. You need to use the word failure and so on. But if you say we're going to exper ex experiment with this, see how it goes and so on, and that comes more in mind with the with the agile way of of, of thinking and and, and uh, doing things. Ashar, I see you n nodding your head in agreement. What is it that J.K. said that made you that sort of brought that light bulb over your head that I see now? Well, a lot of it, right? I mean, and, and the one thing that got my attention was how, how are we willing to try new things to rebuild that connection with our customers, right? Uh, the biggest problem today is there is no emotional connection between banks or financial institutions and the customers. Absolutely. Right? And that is a big issue because so far we've been relying on net promoter score, happy and unhappy customers. But we all know that happy customers who are emotionally connected to banks are actually a lot more profitable to banks as well, right? Today, but you will not find anyone in the room who will say, yes, I'm so excited, I'm a, a customer of bank so-and-so. But you will find people who will say, yes, I'm an Apple fan or I'm a Samsung fan. So the, so the, so the real challenge is um, the business problem we are trying to solve here as a forum, how do we build that emotional connect between banks and customers? And let me give you an example in terms of how those mechanisms are coming to play. 
So for example, banks are doing a lot of, a lot of service to the community, but that is not how they see it, and that is not how the market sees it. Example, Kareem, I got a text from Kareem recently saying, uh, we've just hit one million captains. Okay, but then it continued and said, thank you for supporting one million households and being a loyal customer. And I'm like, wow, really? Without doing anything different between Uber and Kareem, right? It's same service quality, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm making an impact in the community. Wow, right? So uh, the, the, uh, what is behind it is the voice of customer architecture. It is the mindset. It is how we personalize communication and reach out. It is how we break down silos between deposit banking and transaction banking and financing banking and saying, you know, this is a 360 view of customer. If I want to provide the right level of service, I need to move away from traditional segmentation of demographics and income and so forth to say, ah, I understand the likes and dislikes of my customers. I understand their aspirations. I can offer moments-based uh, experience or moment-based uh, products, right? So I, I, feel, I feel that is a paradigm shift. A few banks realize what the underlying problem is, that their customers are absolutely not emotionally connected to them. And if, you know, well, banks who do change that perception will be more successful. Well, thank you. Can and I just add to that? This is a, you have 30 seconds to I, add. I, I will take 30 seconds, actually, only. You just brought a very interesting point about uh, the emotional connection. We were just having an innovation forum in Barcelona with our uh, partners, uh, and it was mostly focused on innovation, and we were talking with our larger merchants and banks, and we had some external speakers and innovators, such as uh, Steve Wozniak. One of the things that came out, and we always say it, but it came out very strongly, is trust is the new gold, and you probably heard this before, and then somebody from, from our merchant partners stood up and said, but we think that love is the new fuel. Because trust is not just, you know, I mean, bank, everybody trusts banks. Actually, banks are the most trusted organizations. But, but, but where is the love, kind of, right, to, to quote the song? And I think that's like the missing piece that now fintechs and mtechs are actually much better at. That's uh, uh, great. And I, and I would, you know, we have a lot of bankers in the room and I think it is really really vital what you mentioned Ashar about um, uh, creating that love with customers um, I've banked with several banks here in Bahrain uh, switched banks many times um, and really the time where I felt the love is the moment they get noticed that I'm changing uh, banks and all of a sudden I'm showered with love and why and so on where were you when I had you know RMs change like every three months I don't know what it is with banking and relationship managers that it can't seem to stay for more than two or three months. There's a constant high turnover. And what I see, in, 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 in no offense to my friends here from the banking industry and the people that we love from the banking industry, but the focus is on compliance, regulatory uh, compliance, and, and KYC issues. And really, the comp I feel, as a consumer, the customer is often taken for granted. So I would agree, and I would think that this is something banks can, 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 can um, uh, work on. Um, I don't know if you want to say something, but I've got to give the, the, the choice to, to Mark. Mark, I want to ask you, I want to go a slightly different direction with you. Now, all these technologies, right, from the blockchain to fintech to whatever you want to call it, uh, artificial intelligence and all that, there is resistance to technology, not only for business and operations perspectives and cultural reasons, people are afraid of losing their jobs. And sometimes they'll scuttle progress because of that fear of losing their jobs. Am I going to be replaced by an app? What, what can we do to address this fear of, of you know, m thousands or millions of people losing their jobs? I think communication is the most important part of that. Communication and a program of education throughout the company. I think a lot of the time, and in fact this is something I learned really early on in my career, as adults, we need to know why something's happening, why we need to make a change. Uh, as someone I, who has three kids, it's not just adults, trust me. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll definitely get a better response if we know why, for sure. And um, I think that's a big part of the problem, is that the, the, the fear comes through the uncertainty the uncertainty and, and, and the fear of change. Like, what, as you say, what is happening? Is an app going to, you know, is, is artificial in, intelligence going to replace my job? I think for, for many people, the answer is yes. For the job that exists now, that won't exist in 10 years' time. And so there needs to be an adjustment period. But it can't be that we just hang these people out to dry. Mm -hmm. 
They have to be supported. And I think part of it is communicating that they will be supported. And then providing uh, training and development to make sure that they can grow within their role. But of course, it takes someone a, in, a, in, a, in a more senior position to understand and to see how things are changing, to know how that, that role is going to change and how they can be supported. So I think where part of the difficulty is, is the pace of change is so fast. It took 8,000 years to move from the agricultural revolution to the industrial revolution, and it's taken 50 years to move from the third to the fourth industrial revolution. So that far outstrips our human ability to keep up with that pace of change. So we need to be open and we need to be transparent and we need to reward sharing of knowledge within our businesses as well. I think a lot of the time I see there's a sense that if I share the knowledge that I have, that makes my job inconsequential, that makes my knowledge inconsequential, therefore I'm less useful to the business. And it's that, that cultural mind shift that needs to happen Whereas if I share my knowledge, we can all grow and we can all develop. And um, I, I think it was, I think it might be AT&T in the US, but I might be mistaken that have, you know, as they're digitalizing and doing transformation, digital transformation, they're retraining all of their staff. They're saying, we're not going to hire any, fire anybody, but you must retrain, offering online courses, university courses, and so on, so let people become... Uh, 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 still relevant in the company. So you might have a switchboard engineer whose job is now completely uh, obsolete. But what they say to him is, right, now upgrade your skill set and so on. They've embraced that and, and, and by all accounts they're doing a very, very good job. Um, okay, I'm, I've, uh, go ahead, we'll go back to you and then Mr. Mustadi. Very quickly, right? I mean, so no two thoughts, we need to reinvent ourselves, right? I mean, two thirds of the skill set today in this room will be irrelevant very soon in the banking industry. So there is a whole lot of responsibility, especially in the front row here, to actually promote a risk-taking culture, to promote successes, but then also promote uh, or encourage when there are failures. There will be failures. So win fast, yes. uh, uh, fail fast. Uh, it, it's the, the, um, the game company Rovio. You may have, you know them better as the developers of, of uh, Angry Birds. They, when they fail, they have a failure party. They open up the champagne and they have a failure party and so on. I think they, you know, embracing this and saying it's okay is, is important and it really it brings us, Mark, back to culture. Right? Culture. If you have a culture of, of openness, culture of communication, culture and so on, that makes the process much, much easier. Sir Ali. Um, thank you. I, I think just to uh, carry on on the same thought, uh, communication is key but also I think what's happening today is not about uh, less people, is, is a new challenges that we are dealing with. Uh, a few years ago, I mean, cyber crime was not in, in a, you know, a front and, and, and the key challenge that we as a banks were uh, challenged with. But today, we need to invest, we need to bring the best protections to our assets and to the client assets. Uh, conf confidentiality is, is, a, is a key thing. Uh, so I think it's not about just automation, it's not just about replacing people with robotics, but also we need to understand that there are new challenges that we need to uh, you know, continue to invest and bring a new technology to keep the bank safe and also, I think the messaging, because when we talk about KYC or when we talk about automation, we only look at the interests of the bank. Uh, I, I think we need to uh, repackage uh, the marketing messaging and also make sure that safer client money is safer bank as well. I mean, those sorts of terms and, and bringing the benefits to the end user is very, very key as we go through this transformation. And, and uh, you mentioned KYC. I was with a bank. I'm no longer with this bank, and, and uh, it's, it's not the sponsor of this bank, this event, so that's the good news. The, 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 um, when I opened an account with them, the KYC process was so painful, really, really painful. It was, it was, it was a very unpleasant process, and it took weeks to do. And, and the reason is because it was after my late father passed away, we had inherited assets, we had to go through a lot and, and provide letters of, you know, anyway, I don't want to get into that. But my point is, once that was all done, 
then I was thinking, you know, I was starting to hear about uh, some of the stocks in Japan, and I wanted to put a little bit of in Japanese stocks. So I called my relationship manager. I said, look, I want to put some stocks in Japan. He said, well, we have this one that has Japanese stocks. We have some that have, uh, you know, Asian stocks. Here's a portfolio of this and this. I said, okay, we'll do this one. Okay, here are the KYC forms. Wait a minute. I've just done this. I've done this. I've done this, and it was quite horrible, quite frankly. It's a requirement. Habibi Rayir Baddil, I changed. There's something we must be able to do about this. I'm not going through this again. He said, I'm sorry, it's a regulatory requirement. I said, I don't want to make the investment. He was shocked. I said, I'm not going through this. You know? And there needs to be a bridge between the regulatory requirement and the, the um, customer experience. There must surely be, if, if my mobile number is in the system already, why do I need to fill out the form again and put my mobile number again and all that kind of stuff? So, and, and, and so I think this, this, this needs to certainly be addressed when it comes to customer experience and user experience. JK, uh, Mr. Ali mentioned cybercrime as a company that's on the forefront. You have literally tens of millions of people's data. How, what are you doing to protect yourself against cybercrime? Great question, I'll tell you why. Because actually we don't have anybody's data. Okay. Yeah, so the data resides at the bank. And by design, uh, payment networks uh, do not take that liability of owning private data. So the only thing we see is transaction, like sanitized transaction information. So for instance, if you swipe your card or make a payment online to buy something, when that payment, when that transaction hits the MasterCard network, all we see is a timestamp, an amount, a 16-digit number, uh, a merchant code, a country of issuing, so where your card came from, the country of the merchant, and uh, the value, if I haven't mentioned that. That's sanitized information. I don't know who that card is, but when it hits JP Morgan's database, they know who that card is because it's a card issued by JP Morgan, let's say. So you're less at risk. So we are very much at almost no risk, except for intervention into our web network or resilience and hence, you know, uptime of the network. Okay. And that's, that, that's why actually our model has been so resilient and I get other questions like, hey, what are you doing about blockchain? Well, we have 80 patents. We're like the third highest, uh, we're the company with the third highest number of patents globally but none of them are, is gonna replace a network because that network doesn't need improvement from a resilience and safety and security perspective. Um, now to your point about cybercrime, and, I, and, I, and this is a very important point that I wanna to tie to another point that you just made, which is that KYC headache and that lack of information about uh, a certain personal entity, like, uh, you know, whether it's actually a person or a company, actually. Um, if, you, if you listen to Ajay Banga, our CEO, two things are in his mind, you know, like when we ask him, hey, Ajay, what makes you stay up at night? Basically, two things, right? Cybersecurity and cybersecurity. And I'll tell you how, how they come in different ways. The first one is cybersecurity in terms of like, you know, if you just look at just the data and the statistics, right? Every company today is at risk somehow. So that's the external risk. But the other one is the other cybersecurity, which is how do we reconcile user experiences with what you're saying, right? How do we reconcile uh, uh, KYC data? How do we not ask clients for 20, 20 times for the same kind of information? And in his mind, that has uh, become a new project which we're working on, which is digital identity. So we're actually working with four or five uh, you know, uh, governments globally uh, on digital identity solutions. Because we feel if you solve for digital identity, you solve for the individual, you solve for national platforms, you solve for infrastructure, and then you can solve for all that KYC overhead that is unnecessary, and I mean, it is necessary, but can be made obsolete. You know, once you have authentication, once I can know for sure that that's you paying or that's you presenting yourself at um, whatever the experience, it doesn't have to be a payment experience even. It could be at the telco provider, you could be at a supermarket. Once I know who you are for sure, there's so many things we can wrap around that. But that element of not knowing, right, that's where the chip and pin comes from. It used to be signature. That's where, you know, above a certain amount when you tap on contactless card, you have to enter your, your chip and pin. That's why when you're on the bank IVR and you ask for sensitive data, they ask you for security questions. So identity is at the core of digitization and emerging technologies. Once we solve for that in a centralized and secure way, like the sky's the limit. And it also almost, almost looks like if you watch some of those futuristic sci-fi, Netflix kind of like, Iris scan, oh yeah, I know it's you. That, that kind of level, right? You don't need to like 
thumbprint every time, enter 20 gazillion passwords that you have to memorize every time, that all goes away. Because we know whenever you're interacting with whatever the interface, that that is absolutely you with 99.99% you know, uh, accuracy. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open the floor to, to um, or, uh, or uh, the questions to the floor rather. If you have a question, can you please get prepared? I'm going to have another very small chat and then I'd l ask you all to take advantage of having these distinguished experts to really ask them some questions. When it comes to questions from the audience, I also have a rule. Please ask a question. Oftentimes someone will raise their hand and then get into a long lecture. So we don't want long lectures, please. We would like some questions. So we have some, some uh, people around here with mics. If you can start getting their attention if you have some questions. Um, uh, Mark, very quickly, what are your thoughts uh, about the threat of cybercrime? Well, it, again, it always it comes down to people for me. Um, uh, not only people, but again, it's that, that pace of change. But where cybercrime is affecting uh, the majority of b banks is that there, isn't, there still isn't enough of investment uh, going into the, the, the back end of that. Um, now, I understand that uh, previously it was said that there is, there is huge trust in banks. I'd say on the other side of things, there's, there's a lot of mistrust of banks as well, but we're in a situation where uh, we're a captive audience. Um, and so therefore, it's often choosing the, the best of a bad bunch. Um, and I think that there's a lot that can be done, again, in terms of communication, in what's being done to mitigate cybercrime, um, and in terms of how that places the customer at the center of the, the, the bank's uh, attentions. Ashar, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, yes, you know, so, so clearly cybersecurity is part of the new financial system infrastructure, absolutely at the core, and so is consent, and so is a uh, number of other issues. My point is, uh, the threat of cybersecurity should not be the excuse holding us back from adopting and trying out new innovations. Right? We will never be in a perfect position to say, I will never, this will never happen to me. As the court says, you know, it's not about if it's going to happen, it's more about when it's going to happen, right? Uh, I, I, so I feel willingness to try is important. Taking calculated risk is important. Banks who are doing that are way ahead. Uh, and as an example, Bahrain allowed EKYC. So you can open, for example, accounts on smartphones. In some other GCC market, there's still workarounds, right? as they try to grapple with the idea of, okay, how do we manage X, Y, and Z issues? So my point is, it's never going to be a perfect situation. Yes, address cybersecurity threat, but then don't let that hold you back from moving on. Uh, if I just add one comment. Very quickly, please. One comment. Uh, I, I think the comment on cybercrime, uh, number one, we can invest a lot in the technology. We can really spend a lot of money, billions of money is spent. But when we do test, 80% uh, of the issue come back to the people. Uh, within JP Morgan, we, we, we sometimes send uh, emails to all the staff. And this is the email that uh, they're supposed to not click the link. Um, and you would see that 80% of the people receiving the email will be clicking uh, Exactly. So, so, so it comes back to people, it comes back to awareness, it comes back to training. Uh, we can spend on the best technology, but if we don't really make it parallel with educating mm -hmm. ourselves mm -hmm. and, and, and creating the right awareness, I think we will come back and we'll have a problem and we'll suffer as a bex. Fantastic. Do we have any questions from the audience? If we can have someone raise their hand, the lighting here is a bit challenging. It looks like we have a question here from the front. Can we have someone bring a microphone? Right here on the front, please. Can you, uh, your name, sir, and, and uh, your question, and if it's addressed to anyone specific or the, general, uh, the, the panel in general? Murad Ali Murad. And to anybody, I have a question of how do we address the issue of fintech as far as in the past 
I remember when we do technology in the bank, it was just part of the business of the bank and internally control. Now FinTech spreads and it needs collective working together. Whether you want to do blockchain or whether you want to do anything else, it relates to many other parties, regulatory body, government institutions, all kind of other parties involved. How do you address that issue to work on fintech in a collective way? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, and, and, and as, as, as brief as you can, we'll give everybody the opportunity to, to answer I, I this I think you've, you've used the right word. I think working together. I, I think there is a space for everyone. And thanks to fintech, because without their um, you know, threats and without their competi competitions, creating the right competitions to the banking environment, we would have never uh, shifted gears and invested in technology. Uh, so I think the answer is there is a space for all of us. And uh, if, 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 if you look at the retail business, I think fintech can do retail business today without even using a bank. Uh, so that's why I think uh, it's a real threat. I think banks need to partner with the right fintech and, and work together to provide better service. And, and we need to, to understand that the, end, the beneficial of all these threats and investment and fintech is the customers, which is very, very important. It's not us, it's not the fintech, it's the customers who will get the best service. Mark, did you want to add something to that? Or? Yeah, I think, there's a, I think there's an excellent opportunity to create collaborative teams. Um, now, I know I, I talk very much about within a company, uh, creating teams that come together from, uh, and lend their expertise from each of their departments until a project's completed, and then they can go back into their, into their departments. So obviously, there's, there's logistic, logistical or operational difficulties potentially with bringing people together from different organizations. Uh, on a more kind of informal basis, but potentially it needs to be formal, where there are uh, organizations, committees, where these people are brought together, and on a weekly or monthly basis, they're, they're talking through the difficulties that are being faced from each and every uh, angle. Uh, we'll allow one more question to go slightly over time here, if there is one more burning question. It seems there are no questions. Excellent. So. Um, I would like to offer my very, very sincere thanks to this very distinguished panel, Mr. Ashar uh, Nazim, uh, FinTech in uh, investor and advisor, uh, Mr. Ali Musa, managing director of JP Morgan uh, here in Bahrain, uh, JK Khalil, general manager of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain for MasterCard, and Mr. Mark, War Mark Warman, founder and digital consultant, East Innovations. May I ask everybody to give them a big hand of applause? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.